Marin County, California, 1989. A small group gathers in the main house of George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch. Surrounded by on-set photos and props from movies like Star Wars, and an awe-inspiring reference library, they're here to discuss how to bring a new story idea to life. It's an exciting concept, a grand science fiction adventure that involves exploration of an alien world and human conflict between its characters. The man behind the idea is celebrated movie director Steven Spielberg, so expectations are high. Four minutes into the meeting, the building begins to tremble. The Loma Prieta earthquake is sending shockwaves through San Francisco, Oakland, and Santa Cruz, leveling buildings and collapsing sections of highway, causing damage that will kill 63 and injure thousands. Though the ranch is far enough away from the epicenter to avoid major damage or injury, this is an inauspicious beginning. Borneo, present day, or thereabouts. A lone astronomer sees a celestial object seemingly appear out of nowhere and streak across radar. It's determined to be an asteroid, and its path is taking it right towards the Earth. Scientists agree the only way to sway the asteroid from its apocalyptic path is with nuclear explosions. A crew is quickly assembled to fly the space shuttle Atlantis up to the asteroid and plant the nuclear devices. But they won't need to be oil drillers because this isn't 1998's Armageddon. This is the LucasArts point-and-click adventure game, The Dig. When Steven Spielberg first came up with the idea that would eventually turn into The Dig, it wasn't intended to be a video game. Initially, he wanted it to be an episode of Amazing Stories, a sci-fi, fantasy, and horror anthology series he created, which ran from 1985 to 1987. It involved an archaeological dig far in the future. It ended with the archaeologists digging up an apparent alien that turned out to be a Mickey Mouse statue. They had been on Earth, digging up Disneyland the whole time. But the idea was too big. It would cost too much to bring to life on TV or even in the movies. Luckily, Spielberg's good friend George Lucas owned a game studio, one that had developed a successful adaptation of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Though the story would change quite a bit from the Planet of the Apes ripoff the original concept sounds like, it was decided The Dig would be a video game. The project leader was Noah Falstein, one of the original Lucasfilm Games employees who had co-led and developed the Indiana Jones games. But he would only be the first in a succession of four different leads. It would take six years and multiple iterations before The Dig was finally released, the longest development of any Lucasfilm adventure game. The beginning of The Dig is one of the strongest game openings I've experienced. The asteroid threat is immediately established, and we're introduced to the characters, getting to know who they are and where tensions will lie. There's Commander Boston Lowe, a straight-laced retired astronaut who wants to get the job done and make a few dad jokes. Ludger Brink is a self-serious geologist and archaeologist who puts science above all. And Maggie Robbins is a reporter who is an expert in languages and new to the concept of taking orders. Lowe talks over Maggie and is a little obsessed with the fact that she's a journalist. Maggie just wants to be taken seriously as part of the team. When one of the trio jokes, the others are serious. They never quite align. There are two other members of the mission who seem more easygoing, but they won't be around for long. The introductory five-minute cutscene interweaves a press conference with footage of the shuttle taking off, ascending to the stars. It builds a sense of anticipation and wonder, which is greatly enhanced by Michael Land's Wagner-inspired synthesized orchestral score. The beginning makes an impact. The player gains control of Lowe as he, Brink, and Robbins leave the shuttle and prepare to set the charges on the asteroid. 
Here, you can talk to your companions and get to know them a little better, and get comfortable with the interface. The goal is to plant the charges at predetermined points on the asteroid, get to a safe range, and detonate. We have detonation. Alpha and May, what are the instruments showing? Nothing big coming our way. What's the pig telling us, Cora? Attila's still in one piece. Hmm, there's a lot of seismic bounds, so some fracturing. When this is done, the team makes their way back and finds they can descend into the interior of the asteroid. What they find inside doesn't seem like the ragged and violent result of an explosion, but something smooth and familiar. Something intentional. Lowe reveals that part of this mission was to be on the lookout for possible alien life, which helps explain the puzzling choice of crew members. A simple puzzle later, and the asteroid turns into a ship, taking them to an alien planet far, far away from home. The introspective, exploration-heavy, point-and-click adventure that The Dig was released as was a far cry from the original version of the game. Steven Spielberg says his story was based on two movies, Forbidden Planet and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Noah Felstein's version was closest to this, with two teams of scientists competing for resources and discoveries about an ancient civilization, and turning on each other out of greed, fear, and the influence of what they find. It was set in the distant future. Rather than being brought to a new planet by some unknown force, the characters would have traveled there intentionally, with the purpose of exploiting this alien world. The player would get to switch between controlling two opposing characters, and get to explore multiple alien cities and environments. Most notably, it was not a straight point-and-click adventure. While it would have puzzles, Falstein wanted to incorporate role-playing and survival elements, with players needing to find food and water to stay alive. This was not something others at Lucasfilm were entirely comfortable with. The Dig version 1 was an ambitious project, too ambitious considering how Lucasfilm was working at the time. At this point, most of their adventure games were made by small teams of only a few people who could to some degree make it up as they went along. They generally only took a year from concept to release. But with the large scope of the Dig, it wasn't practical to be without design documents and a solid plan. After 18 months of development, little real progress had been made, and the game wasn't even close to being in a playable state. Though things would change a lot from the initial concept, you can still see the themes of exploration, human conflict, and being influenced by alien artifacts running through the final game. Lowe, Brink, and Robbins arrive on an alien world that is both desolate and beautiful, with vistas that look like vintage sci-fi book covers. Luckily, it also has a breathable atmosphere. While Brink is keen to explore and find out more about this place, Lowe's ultimate goal is just to get back home. I love Brink's focus on exploration and scientific discovery, and having an archaeologist character in a game that actually acts like one. Look how close the stones fit, like ancient Peruvian masonry. So it's primitive. There was nothing primitive about ancient Peruvian masonry, Commander Lowe. While Lowe will do whatever he thinks he needs to find and manipulate things to help them out, Brink is concerned about destroying data and possible messages from whatever brought them here. These tensions don't get to simmer long. While following a mysterious energy source that is seemingly leading the group towards something important, Brink falls through some unstable ground and is killed. Ah! Brink! I couldn't get to him in time. I couldn't. It happened too fast. Robbins begins to doubt that traveling together is any safer than going it alone, and decides to go off by herself, despite Lowe's protests. Exploring the surroundings, Lo soon finds some mysterious energy crystals. A display in what he deems the museum shows these crystals being used to repair and restore. With little to lose, he uses one on Brink, and it brings him back from the dead. But something has changed, 
Brink seems a little off. He becomes obsessed with learning more about these powerful crystals and collecting as many of them as he can. Robbins, for some reason, doesn't consider resurrecting the dead something worth returning to the group for, and Brink also ends up leaving to pursue his obsession. Once again, Boston Lowe and the player end up alone. I do think it was a missed opportunity to have the three crew members separated for so much of the game. That first 30 minutes really feels like something special, and it's so much more natural to learn about things through conversation rather than Lowe just commenting to himself. Also, I would have really loved to experience this game from the point of view of the journalist or the scientist, rather than Lowe, who really exemplifies the everyman that always got to be the protagonist. You can still call your companions on your communicator, and will have to interact with them at key moments. But the story, conflict, and even the puzzles could have been much more engaging if everyone stuck together for longer. Interestingly, it seems that Brink was supposed to travel with Lowe for most of the game, but according to lead programmer Gary Brubaker, a bug was discovered late in development that required a huge redesign which caused Brink and Lowe to go their separate ways. In 1990, Lucasfilm Games became LucasArts, and during this restructuring, Falstein was let go, and The Dig was temporarily shelved. The next person to attempt to steer the project into something viable was Brian Moriarty, who had previously made the magical and musical graphic adventure Loom. While he thought Falstein's vision had nice art and good ideas, there was no clear path to continue on. Most of the previous work got thrown out, and the project was basically started from scratch. The characters, plot, art, and genre were all changed, and things started to much more closely resemble the version that would eventually release. This is where the idea of an asteroid and an unplanned trip across the stars started out, though it featured four characters instead of the three we got. The fourth was Toshi Olema, a Japanese millionaire and hobby scientist who funded the expedition. Four characters were even featured on the original cover art for the game, but eventually Olema got cut out. Moriarty also introduced the backstory for the alien species the crew would eventually contact. The aliens had found a way to live in a multi-dimensional paradise where they didn't have to worry about mortality. Wanting to know if there were other sentient beings out there worthy of sharing the secret with, they sent ships in the guise of asteroids to bring others to their planet. The tone was quite mature, often violent at the behest of Steven Spielberg, and used a lot of scientific jargon. Given that The Dig was created by a Hollywood director, Moriarty also wanted to make this game more cinematic than previous LucasArts adventures. The team ended up creating a new engine called StoryDroid that was a mashup of the usual LucasArts adventure engine Scum and interactive streaming animation engine, known as Insane, which was first developed for Star Wars Rebel Assault. Using this new engine, the team was able to build a working alpha. From clips and screenshots of this version that still exist, it's clear that much of Moriarty's vision would make it into the final game. The backgrounds and color palette created by artist Bill Eakin would stay mostly the same, though some art and events would be updated, and the game's UI would get a complete overhaul. Moriarty's version used a more obvious UI with commands examine, pick up, use, and move. The UI that would make it into the game is very simple. There's no system of verbs or actions to use like many previous LucasArts games. You just click on an object, possibly with an item out of your inventory screen selected, and Lowe will perform the appropriate action or make a comment. Get used to hearing It won't do anything. It won't do anything. It won't do anything. A lot. You can also click on other characters, which brings up a dialogue system that allows you to ask about particular things you've encountered, ask a general question, or make a statement. With the originally planned survival and RPG elements gone, the focus is now on the puzzles, and they're a bit of a mixed bag. Often, solutions are hinted at long before you've even found the puzzle they're referring to. A few puzzles even seem to break the rules in a way. 
One that's really rather simple once you know the answer involves just holding down the mouse button on an in-game button. Easy. But as an avid adventure game player, I can't think of another time I had to hold down the mouse button rather than just click it. The worst puzzle involves a type of claw machine you need to use to retrieve a lens from deep in a hole. But the interface beside the controls looks like a game of the code-breaking game Mastermind. As I pressed buttons and lights appeared on the screen, I kept waiting to be given feedback that would help me determine how many colors I got right and if they were in the correct positions. But instead, with no sense of scale to refer to, the goal was to program in a series of directions to get the claw to find and grab the lens. This was the worst puzzle, and has the misfortune of being one of the first, which sets a poor tone. On the bright side, it only gets better from here. Other puzzles involve things like reassembling an alien skeleton, light refraction to get old technologies working, and basic inventory puzzles. Even when they're obtuse, at least it makes narrative sense that the problems and devices you're encountering feel completely alien to you. As had been popularized in earlier LucasArts adventures like The Secret of Monkey Island, there's no way to die in the dig, so you can feel free to experiment without worry. The developers, though, were never without worry. Despite the great amount of progress made under Brian Moriarty, the dig was still in jeopardy. It was uncoordinated, highly publicized, and put under extra scrutiny because of its Hollywood affiliations. When a new opportunity came up in 1993, Moriarty left LucasArts. He considers the dig a professional catastrophe and an example of how not to build an adventure game. The dig's third project leader was Dave Grossman, who had been involved with development from the start, helping with design and writing. He had previously written and programmed the first two Monkey Island games, as well as co-designing Day of the Tentacle. Grossman was lead for only a few months, mostly trying to iron out the design, edit out some extraneous things, and get it into a bit better shape before Sean Clark, the final project lead, took over. Were this any other project that didn't have the fortune, or misfortune depending on who you asked, of having Spielberg's name attached to it, it likely wouldn't have gotten six years to come to fruition. Some of the project leads even tried to have it cancelled. Spielberg's interest in gaming goes all the way back to Pong, which he would play on the set of Jaws with Richard Dreyfuss. He usually had the latest arcade cabinet in his office, and even had a hand in pushing for a video game adaptation of E.T., for better or for worse. His idea for it was more of a Pac-Man clone than it turned out to be, though. He made the most of his friendship with George Lucas, who himself was not all that interested in games, to get access to the developers and a look at the development process. Brian Moriarty has shared anecdotes of Spielberg calling him up to get hints on how to progress in Loom as he played through with his son. And Noah Falstein reported that Spielberg playtested Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and even found a significant bug. When it came to the dig, Spielberg was quite involved, even designing some of the puzzles and scenes. He was behind the more gory ideas, like having Brink's hand cut off, cutting into the eye of a sea creature and having its blood splatter the monitor, and having the eventually removed fourth character get dissolved in acid. Most of these scenes would not make it into the final game. After he received criticism from parents for Jurassic Park being too scary for children, he asked the developers to tone things down a bit so the game was more family-friendly. The Dig differed from most LucasArts adventures because it wasn't a comedy. Of course there are some humorous lines and easter eggs, but it's trying to tell a story that is serious, scientific, and philosophical. This was a challenge, in the words of Sean Clark because you couldn't cover up a bad puzzle with a funny line of self-referential dialogue. Overall, I think it succeeds in telling its story. It develops from a straightforward space mission, to an exploration of an alien landscape and a fight to survive against both alien and human dangers. Then it turns into a thoughtful, if slightly rushed, meditation on responsible wielding of power. 
Though I would have liked to have more time traveling with the whole crew, there is something to be said for the feeling of isolation the game offers as you explore alone. There was once a great civilization here. You can see signs of it in artifacts left behind, and even feel it in the air at times. Eventually, you'll find one of these alien creatures. While their backstory is similar to the one Moriarty came up with, here they haven't sent the asteroid to Earth as a test, they've sent it as an SOS. The higher plane of existence they've found isn't the paradise they thought, and they've been languishing without feeling for millennia. The plight of the aliens is revealed and resolved in quick order at the finale, not really given the room it needs to breathe. However, Brink's fascination with the life crystals gets more attention and serves as a good analog. Though he thinks they're making him stronger and smarter, they're actually making him dependent and isolating him from the world. The three main characters are brought to life by a decent cast. Lowe is voiced by Robert Patrick, best known at the time for being T-1000 in Terminator 2. This is the source of a number of little easter eggs and joking references. Have you seen this boy? What? Nothing. Brink is voiced by the prolific voice actor Steve Bloom. A few of my favorite roles from him were Grunt in Mass Effect 2 and Ogryn in Dragon Age Origins. Robbins is voiced by Mari Weiss, who isn't quite as well known, but has appeared in both live action and animated shows. I think everyone in the cast does a good job on their own, but overall the voice work and dialogue suffers by having all three characters playing the straight man. The person who would finally bring the dig to its development conclusion was Sean Clark, who had been involved to some degree from the very beginning. After he wrapped up work on Sam and Max Hit the Road, which released at the end of 1993, he took on leading the final stretch for The Dig. While he did keep about 80% of Moriarty's story, he still made significant changes. To start with, he cut out the fourth character to save time on animations and dialogue, and chose to go back to the Scum engine, rather than take a risk with the unproven story droid. He also completely changed the ending of the game, and worked with author Orson Scott Card to rewrite much of the dialogue. Most of the artwork from the previous version was kept, though some improvements were made. When Bill Tiller took over as art director, he had better quality tools like Photoshop, and was able to improve color gradations on existing backgrounds. He also created some new background art, and worked on the animations and cutscenes. It was tradition at this time at LucasArts to hold a pizza orgy when a game reached a playable state, and this sounds a little more exciting than it really is. What it was, was having everyone in the company get together to eat pizza and play the game, with the caveat that they had to provide feedback. While this sounds like fun, it could be tough, especially for this project. The first pizza orgy happened for Moriarty's version, and he resigned on the same day. The event for Clark's version went better than that, though the team was subjected to some harsh criticism. Many people had dig fatigue and were resentful of all the attention and time the project was getting. That seemed to come out in the feedback. One piece of feedback to come out of the pizza orgy was that mixing 2D and 3D effects was a mistake. This was a criticism even Bill Tiller agreed with. However, when I first played it, and even playing through now, I find these scenes very impressive. When you're looking at a static background, and all of a sudden the view pulls back and low walks towards the camera, it's quite striking looking. When the dig was finally released, it was criticized for its dated looking visuals. The pixel graphics, especially for the character designs and animations, are slightly inferior to Full Throttle, which released the same year. Some publications even criticized it for using cartoony characters and taking up only one disc, rather than real actors like Phantasmagoria and taking up seven discs. This is a criticism which seems laughable now. The data technology complaint pales when you take in the beautiful colors and alien designs you'll be treated to throughout the game. The oranges and purples are warm and inviting, while the rocky spires and crystalline artifacts are strange and alien-looking. 
Where the game succeeds most is in capturing a sense of wonder. The puzzles can be obtuse, the dialogue can be dull, but the environment, the beautiful twilight colors, the alien geography and strange creatures, the curiosity of what brilliant sights you'll find next, do a lot of heavy lifting to pull the player through the less successful parts. As I play it, even though I've played it many times before, I'm always excited to see what wondrous things are around the next corner. The Dig was finally released on November 30th, 1995. Six years, one month, and 13 days after that first fateful meeting at Skywalker Ranch. The game credits reference the troubled development with a section called Ghosts of Dig's Past, which lists all the people who had worked on previous versions. Despite all its problems and the length of development, it did become the best-selling LucasArts adventure game of that time, selling 300,000 copies. Spielberg was pleased with the final product and sent a letter to each person who had developed it, thanking them for their hard work. And that is the story behind The Dig. The game also got a novelization by Alan Dean Foster. I read through this in the hopes of learning more about the backstory of the aliens or the characters, but honestly, the less said about this book, the better. If it does anything, it actually detracts from the story of the game by writing the characters poorly and adding a bunch of scenes which just aren't needed. The Dig is not a perfect game, but it is a unique and beautiful one, and considering all the trouble the development went through, I think it turned out pretty well. If you're at all interested in exploring alien planets, beautiful backgrounds, and point-and-click adventure games, I definitely recommend giving it a shot. This is probably the video I've put the most time and work into uh, on my whole channel, so I especially appreciate any shares this time around. If you want to see more, check out my video on Rekka and the history of the Summer Shoot'em Up competition. I also have a Patreon if you want to support my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.